the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, uh, that's, uh, so I'm going to, as, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Singh suggested, there's going to be sort of uh, two parts uh, to this conversation. Um, I'm going to sort of stick at sort of 35,000 feet and, and talk a, a little bit about some of the trends, um, as well as some of the, uh, some of the kind of enablers and, and some of the constraints that face uh, uh, academics who face researchers as they start to make that transition from being a uh, sort of focusing on general research uh, to having to think about all the multitude of activities and inputs that are required in order to be able to stand up a successful life science venture. Um, and then I'll sort of provide sort of one or two sort of um, uh, cute examples that, uh, I, that I like to, to refer back to that, that not from Hamilton, but, but sort of globally that, that uh, might kind of give a little bit of texture um, and then, and then we're uh, really, really fortunate to have Matthew here, who is actually doing uh, doing the thing. Uh, he's actually building a company, uh, and he'll be able to talk a little bit more in detail about that. Um, in terms of kind of uh, expectations, I know this is a seminar, so if there's something that I say that's of interest, just uh, raise your hand or uh, put it in the chat, um, and we can try and respond to it in real time. Or, or if it is something that's better, sort of parked to to the end, uh, happy to do that as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, usually I have two screens up, um, so, uh, so bear with me here um, if I sort of jump back and forth. But I am going to, let's see if I can do this. Um, uh, is, are, is everyone able to see? It's usually the- Yes. Yep, fabulous. Okay, so we don't need to dwell on this. So the first I'm gonna sort of very, um, very quickly, just talking about like, some some little trends uh, in in health innovation that I see. Um, uh, as as sort of the Provost said, there's um, no, nothing is certain, so so please take this with a big grain of salt. Um, I think the what I what I want to sort of start though with and this is just a graph of um, Canada's healthcare spending from 2000. The sort of the top line is sort of per capita. Uh, and the bottom line is the percentage of GDP. And I think that uh, probably doesn't take too much to just sort of see where the trend is here. And it's really this rising cost, which is uh, driving the impetus for innovation in healthcare. Um, we're actually quite good um, at keeping people, people alive. We're actually quite good at delivering care. Um, where we have, I think, some challenges is containing so, so, some of those costs. And the cost drivers are really driven around a few kind of key factors. So you have, you know, your staff. So, and, um, you know, so the, the cost of um, acquiring um, all the people who need to be able to, to, to deliver care. Um, and of course, another big cost are, are all the consumables and, and devices and drugs that, that, that go into kind of extending people's lives and improving, and improving patient outcomes. Um, the, this is kind of important for kind of two reasons. One is, and it creates a bit of a paradox. One is that that there is, um, that the, there is a, a desire for cost containment. So um, people are looking around, trying to find uh, ways that they can uh, they, they can kind of trim budgets and, and control these costs. Um, but uh, but paradoxically, a lot of the novel devices, a lot of novel drugs, a lot of the novel uh, uh, treatments and therapies that come into the market end up costing a lot, and so. So you're so as someone who wants to become an entrepreneur in this space, you're coming into uh, a, a system um, that is that is looking to 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 cover costs. And if and if your innovation is not um, sort of kind of geared towards cost containment, um, you, you know you you have you're going to have two hurdles that you're going to have to deal with. The first one is you know how can I convince um, how can I convince you that my innovation is worthy and actually improves patient outcomes, but then also how can my new cost um, fit into the sort of the, the cost structure that already exists. So it just, I just wanted to sort of, sort of put this just sort of in the back of your head as, as, as sort of as we, as we talk forward. Um, uh, so, so Rong asked me to, to sort of say, well, what are some of the things, you know, that, you know, people are working on, you know, what, what are, what, what are the trends in and, and sort of getting back to previously, it was, uh, the, the previous slide is, it's, I think that, the, a lot of the trends are really around kind of this idea of getting more, um, or at least the same outcome uh, for for less. 
Um, as a result, a big set of trends because one of the primary cost drivers um, in the system is doctors uh, and nurses and, and staff. It's about how do we enable patients to take care of themselves? How do we, how do we allow them to be able to, to, to more wholly and fully control uh, the, you know, their own care, the, the, the way in which they manage, manage their own data, the way they manage their own, um, their own treatment, um, et cetera. And so, so you can sort of see, this is just, I mean, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but, you know, there's, you know, hospital home is, um, is sort of the, the watchword, certainly at least, and, and most of this is sort of in a Canadian, sort of Ontario Canadian context, you know, hospital home is sort of the watchword for, um, for for uh, for at, at a policy level, so how do we get people out of hospitals, which is sort of costs an incredible amount of money, it can cost thousands of dollars a day to, to take care for someone in a hospital, it might only cost hundreds of dollars a day to care for them in uh, you know in a in a long term care facility, and then it may only cost you know uh, you know a hundred or fifty dollars a day for them to be at home. So there's this how do we get them out of the home? Enabling this are things like remote monitoring and mobile apps that that allow for um, allow for uh, uh, un, um, unobtrusive and, and um, uh, observations of patients to be able to track so that, so that you can assist them with being able to identify when they might, when, they're, when their case might be turning uh, into, into something a bit more acute that, that could actually re require a, a more high cost intervention. Um, underlining remote monitoring mobile apps is sort of, is, is big data AI analytics and and that's, you know, uh, that's the buzzwords on everyone's lips. I would say that um, uh, we haven't cracked AI in healthcare um, by any stretch. I think that most people, when they talk about um, uh, sort of artificial intelligence or, you know, the doctor support are, are really talking just about being able to, to, to wrap one's head around um, Around uh, uh, around around the, the the enormous volume of data that's that's being generated every year. I think I think I was at a at a talk a, a little while ago, and someone uh, said that that we're getting to the point now where we're generating terabytes of data every day, um, kind of through the healthcare system, and you know, let alone like we're not storing it, let alone even being able to do analytics on it. Um, and that but that there's a huge opportunity there, and there's and there's a lot of a lot of attention focus on on seeing that. Um, the, the bottom three are just, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, the, the, uh, the last one, which is sort of uh, around specific technologies is, is around precision medicine. So this is a, this is a case where leveraging now the computing power that we have leveraging our control over, um, you know, at, at kind of at the nano, at the nano scale, um, and leveraging actually our data, our, our capacity to data analytics is, is about trying to craft care, whether it's a, whether it's a specific type of drug sort of formulated for an individual or, or it's, uh, you know, a, uh, a care protocol that is, that is geared specifically to, to a person that this idea of, 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 of not providing cookie cutter care is, is something that's, um, is, is also uh, certainly a, a big trend we're seeing. The uh, procurement, um, I put that here mostly because um, procurement and how procurement works is uh, is 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 ever evolving, ever uh, 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 obscure, um, and is something that um, uh, anyone who's thinking about starting up a company needs to be keep their eye on what the trends are in there. So, so I'm not going to be I don't want to dwell too much on that, but I just do want to say that 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 procurement, which is which has always been a bit of a uh, a bit of a challenge for companies operating in Canada. Um, there, there are efforts to try and make this a little bit easier. Um, things like the Can Health Network, um, trying to link hospitals with with kind of new technology. But that's that sort of figure, figuring that out is going to be is going to be something that that I think will be will be on top of mind uh, kind of going forward. And then the final bit is this commercialization of health IP. And I, uh, this is a bit of a weird one to kind of pack in, but it, it's very important, I think, especially in the, in the, in the context of um, in McMaster, uh, where you guys are at, is that there is an increasing desire uh, up the kind of up the, the, the food chain at Mac about the importance of being able to take general research and to apply it in, um, in, a, in and, and to be able to um, to to move from the bench into the market and, and and transform learning into something that actually has real world patient outcomes and and what we're seeing there as a result is, and this is happening um, in universities and and uh, academic centers and, and research institutes across Canada 
what we're seeing is you're seeing money flowing in in a way that we hadn't, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago into, uh, into potential ventures. And so that commercialization process is, is really, um, is, is kind of really exciting and, and, and certainly a, a positive trend. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, kind of the uh, enablers um, and constraints in health innovation. And actually I just, um, I'm actually gonna ask, I'm just gonna stop here. Matthew, can you send me like a little chat when I'm, cause I can't actually see uh, my, okay, it's 11.15. I just wanna make sure sort of maybe when I get to the 11.30 mark, can you, if, I, if I'm still talking, can you give me a little bit of a nudge? Um, all right, thanks. So, so are there, when you think about kind of enablers and constraints, there are a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different angles you can think about it um, that, that are driving and helping to, uh, to, to, to allow um, uh, uh, health innovation and, and novel technologies to be able to flourish. And, and uh, where, where you sit and, and, and what kind of hat you're wearing will really drive you know, kind of what some of those enablers and constraints are going to be. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm just going to sort of put it, I'm going to sort of, we're going to put our company hat on. Um, so, so if you're, if you're the entrepreneur, if you're the person who's, who's developing the technology, what are the things that some of the things that you kind of need to think about? And the hope here is that as, as you reflect on the work that you're doing, as you reflect on kind of where you are, um, and 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 the 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 access to kind of the intellectual property that you've either developed or 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 can see or or are helping to assist to develop, if you do want to take that pivot and to think about uh, 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 becoming an entrepreneur, bringing that stuff to market, this is just sort of, sort of some of the things just to to kind of to sort of keep top of mind. And again, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Probably each one of these could be its own session, but um, but but there we are. So. Uh, kind of the corporate focus on innovation is really, um, you know, these are the three things that 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 will you'll show up on on every brochure. Um, uh, you know, this is this is this is of course, you know, of course we all want to improve patient outcomes. We all want to transform the delivery of healthcare. We all want to, uh, you know, uh, drive operational efficiency and cost containment. Um, but but as a uh, and this is this is important, especially for those who are a little bit more academically inclined. Critically, if you want to become an entrepreneur, you have to really be thinking about how to generate a return on investment. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to kind of to to use that or to turn that phrase, but really, you need to you need to be uh, thinking about how is it that that you're going to be able to um, create a product that um, people want to pay for, uh, so that you can. Um, so that you can, uh, so you can grow, so that you can, um, so you can pay for, pay for uh, future development, et cetera. The, the purpose uh, of a company is, is to generate, generate those returns. Um, and if that's not something you feel comfortable with, that's fine. But then, 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 then just be conscious that, that it's going to uh, be nigh on impossible to, to start a company um, uh, without, without kind of, without having that, you know, in conjunction with all the all the items on the top. So um, uh, I'm a, a I'm sort of a consultant. As one of the many things that I've done in the past is as a consultant. So therefore, you know, I had to think about how do I create a two by two matrix um, and sort of bring that in. So uh, I started trying to sort of think about kind of constraints and enablers. I think so, you know we've got some internal ones and we've got some uh, um, external ones and and I just want to sort of walk through some of these. So um, what is going to allow for and enable a successful um, company? Um, what are the things that need to be kind of pulled together? And um, uh, first I'll, I'll, I'll preface everything I'm gonna say afterward that, that, that sometimes this is just not fair. Um, there is nothing, um, there's nothing that, the, there, there's, there's nothing that that guarantees success um and sometimes people are just happen to be in the right time right place at the right time um uh, and 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 are therefore able to navigate all of the obstacles that they're going to face um and 
you know, that sort of that's that's true, you know, right with the, you know, the first one, the first two that I've got here, which is kind of strong leadership and, and access to motivated talent. Um, uh, without these two things, um, it's it's incredibly difficult uh, to be able to be successful. There's just the 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 level of competition, um, the 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 complexity of standing up and navigating through all the regulatory burdens um, of being able to develop relationships of being able to actually also produce high quality science just requires um, that, 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 that a team that is able to marshal resources and to be able to focus and, and drive towards um, uh, the, the, the goal of creating and staying up a company. Um, and so that's just, uh, and 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 sometimes it's just you know the, the talent just isn't there, um, and and it's one of the reasons why um, uh, many companies that are founded in Canada uh, look elsewhere and sort of you know migrate down to the United States. It's not because there's there's a uh, not because there's a, a strong urge to to live in you know in in California or in or in you know Boston, but rather that you know that's you kind of you're going where the talent is because it's a really key input. Um, I'm gonna, the, the fourth one, kind of understanding the market and the voice of the customer, and I suspect Matthew probably can speak uh, this, I, I hope, well, I hope all of this resonates with Matthew and I'm not off base, but, but this is a, a really critical one. Um, uh, and, and, and particularly, int particularly of interest for, for, again, people who are for, for, for intellectual property or for ideas that are coming out of an academic sitting, setting. So, um, you know, much like the, uh, uh, journal writing exercise. If you're, um, if you're, if, if, if you, you need to convince and you need to be able to, to I find um, a, a, a group of people or, or uh, individuals or systems that are going to be interested in, uh, in your product, and um, and and you have to keep in mind one sim simple fact, which is that the customer is always right. And it's the customer who is going to um, who is going to help you understand um, what are the features, what are the characteristics, what are the use cases, what are the um, what's the you know what how, what does the experience feel like when using your product? Because if they aren't willing to, or if they aren't happy, if they aren't satisfied, they are just simply not going to purchase your product, and you will end up producing something that no one buys and have an empty warehouse. Um, full of stuff. So, so understanding that and having those conversations is, is, is a really internal, is really key internal enabler. So too often what happens is that someone gets a really cool piece of, um, of science. They say this is really neat. It, it excites me. And they, they put all this money, all this time, all this investment, and they never go and bother to see if anyone else is excited by it. And they arrive and they only to discover that no one wants it or, or even worse, someone invented it five years ago, or even worse, you know, uh, uh, it was it was introduced ten years ago, and now and has been and has been discredited. So you just make sure you understand you know who you're selling to. The um, the availability of capital I think is a, is a simple one. Um, the clear approach to kind of the commercialization process. This is a this is there's a lot packed into this um, into this into this uh, bullet, but really it's around understanding that that taking a product to market is very different than doing the science. To discover whether or not there is, um, you know, a positive outcome or 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 uh, or statistically relevant impact of whatever of whatever you're working on, and and that and in fact, actually, just getting the getting the um, getting the science right is actually just the first step on the commercialization path. That there's that there's a lot of there's a lot of steps that kind of that follow that. Fortunately, there's a lot of um, support systems. So uh, Matthew's actually at the Forge. That's a really great place. There's the tech transfer office, um, and there's uh, there's others in in the community who can help you um, kind of work through that. But understanding that 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 where you are in the process and what needs to come next is going to be a really important enabler for for being able to be to, to uh, start up um, a successful uh, new venture. Um, some of the constraints. So these are just some of the stumbling blocks. Um, uh, oftentimes, um, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you fail to have kind of a, a compelling value proposition, if you're, if you're not able to explain to yourself, to your, to your team, to others, um, what it is that you're doing, what, like where the value is, where the, where the benefit is of your product, it's going to really, it's going to cause, uh, it's going to really cause some friction. 
Um, this is the second one uh, and the third one are, are really important. Again, for, for those of you who are kind of in an academic setting, um, uh, you know, professors um, are often the source of a lot of really cool intellectual property, but the problem is, is that their incentives, what, you know, how they get rewarded um, how their status is, is, is assigned is really decoupled from um, all of the requirements uh, to, to drive a, a company. And unless, there's a, it, unless those incentives are aligned, um, then, then you're going to have sort of real challenge. And by that, I mean sort of, you know, a professor's reward when, when they publish their paper uh, or publish a paper and everyone knows about, about their discovery, a company wants to keep that that intellectual property and those business processes very close to their heart because they don't want anyone else to to be able to see and steal steal that or um, so so again this is sort of sort of you got to make sure that your your the incentives are aligned. Um, production quality is um, uh, this is a, a big stumbling one is that sometimes people think well look if I can just get to market fast um, uh, then then I'll you know I'll be successful but unfortunately. Healthcare is is a, a very particular one where where the do no harm is is uh, is 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 not just uh, is not just a saying it's 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 like the oath um, that care providers take, and so you're going to want to just make sure that that you're not skimping out on um, on kind of on, on on those inputs to to whatever products you're building. Um, sunk cost. This is uh, what I mean here is that. Um, sometimes companies need to pivot and they need to think, they need to having, going back to understanding the market, they may have conversations with the market and then discover, um, they may discover how, uh, or they may discover that, that in fact they need to do something else. Being obstinate and, and not pivoting um, can be, can, it can often occur because you put so much time and effort and energy of yourself into, um, into developing uh, this product, so it's like your baby, uh, throwing it out and changing course can be really challenging. And, and, and that oftentimes is, um, that oftentimes doesn't happen and, and companies burn through all their cash and that's, and that's the end of it. Um, I see a question from Audrey. How, ha um, how have you helped academics manage that conflict between the need to publish and the need to protect the IP? So Audrey, this is a really great question. So generally the, um, so I specifically, haven't assisted them, but what what generally happens is that we the the we sort of we encourage um, the uh, we encourage sort of a going after making sure that you get a provisional patent um, uh, on on the kind of the core IP and and in some cases what you need to do is you need to if you really need to publish you kind of almost need to do a bit of a bank shot so your 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 publishing outcomes. Uh, 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 rather than you're publishing the outcomes and the Im about the outcomes and the impact, rather than about the underlying process by which you know you built um, you know a particular piece of software code or or that you built a um, or, or 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 demonstrating how you were able to isolate a particular compound, um, and so um, so that but it 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 it, it is a challenge. Um, I mean, in the end. Uh, it will it will often be possible for someone to try and reverse engineer your technology, um, but the but but I think the, the 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 advice I give most often is like well is it you know is it possible to 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 simply hold off from publishing um, the the core pieces of knowledge um, rather than uh, uh, you know uh, and 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 hold that until a later date um, after the company's sort of been established and um, and 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 you've you've determined what can be released into the kind of public space. Hopefully that hopefully that helps. Um, so um, I'm gonna pivot over here so, so kind of what are some of the external name oh yeah so there it is. Uh, so, so uh, Dr. Zeng has, has mentioned, yeah. So it's not always a conflict. You can kind of file, you can do these provisional patents, um, and it's and again, it's it's about it's about just being conscious about sort of that um, about that IP because the, the in the end, it's the intellectual property, the the business practices that you that you develop, the trade secrets that you develop, are that's 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 what that well, that's what locks in a lot of the value that that uh, you're creating as a, as a new entrepreneur. I'm just going to um, chime in. I'm just gonna yeah, chime okay, in. go ahead, Matthew. 
you know, they don't have to necessarily be in parallel either because within the US, you have a year grace period to file your provisional uh, with publication. Uh, but I'll talk more on this about patents and how to sort of delay those costs as long as possible during my talk. Excellent. And that's good because, and, and I, I'm probably appropriate given that Matthew's actually published, whereas I have only observed other people publishing. <laughs> um, so some of the external enablers. Um, uh, so, you know, what is going to make a company, what is the external environment? What are the, what's the context out in the, out, out in the world that is going to actually allow for um, a new product, a novel innovation to be successful? Um, well, first and foremost, foremost, there needs to be kind of an acute clinical or patient need. Um, uh, 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 the showing up and trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Um, everyone will nod and sort of sagely say that looks like fantastic technology. And then uh, no one will buy it. Um, and, and so that, so, so identifying a problem is going to be, is going to be something that's um, uh, really important. Um, especially for companies that are just starting up the presence of a clinical champion who can advocate for your product, who can perhaps um, stimulate the procurement process, who can um, help you run uh, tests in order to be able to um, assess the, um, the efficacy of your, of your technology is also going to be a really important uh, enabler. Um, this is life, you know, uh, healthcare um, is, is a really it's a very frustrating, uh, can be a very frustrating uh, industry or sector to play in as, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a company, um, because of how many different stakeholders um, are, you know, are, are, are involved, how many different choke points and bottlenecks exist where, uh, where it, you, know, you can turn left to succeed and turn right to fail, um, and how many of those uh, exist outside of um, of the company. I mean, we just, uh, you know, that we started off this section by showing sort of eight different stakeholder groups. Um, but the, you know, the, the having clinical champions can, can, can really assist it, help you navigate and, you know, navigate hospitals and identify, you know, resources and, and all sorts of things. Um, I, the alignment of incentives is also, um, you know, important for kind of an external environment. So again, you want to make sure that, um, that, that, or not make sure, but you're going to you're going to want to seek out institutions or or potential customers where they are going to be receptive to adopting new technology so if you're you know if you're if you're trying to sell into uh you know a clinic that has no flexibility to move um you know they're they're unless you're selling you know syringes that they already bought um, you know, or that, you know, that they, you know, that like a consumable that they are, you know, that they've historically already bought and you're trying to sell them at a lower price, um, you may not find, um, you know, a high level reception. Um, empowered patients and empowered practitioners are also really key um, external enablers. So, um, and, and by that, I mean, patients who can advocate uh, for themselves and who can demand um, uh, sort of uh, additional care can be really helpful when you're trying to bring innovation in. Um, and then empowered practitioners are also really, are also really important. And this is slightly different than a clinical champion. By that, I mean, it's just practitioners who have the latitude to be able to test um, new products and, and who have the ability to demand and request um, new technology to kind of be, to be brought into the, to, to brought into their clinic or brought into their, into their, into the hospital or whatnot. Uh, luck is a real one. Uh, I talked a little bit at the beginning about the idea of sometimes you just need to be in the right time, in the right place, and uh, and and that and that some of these things you don't have control over, and, and luck is certainly um, certainly a really key external enabler. Um, though though I think I remember hearing someone say that that uh, you know uh, that, that 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 luck seems to only come to those who work hard. Um, so that that is indeed true. I mean, so it's it's not a substitute for hard work, but it certainly it's, it can be a nice a nice boost. Um, so some of the external constraints. Oh, another, sorry, another bit on the chat. Um, excellent. Uh, so I will sort of, I'll sort of, um, I'll sort of speed up here. So some of the external constraints here we've got, um, and, and these would be things that uh, I sort of are, are probably abound and sort of, you can read about them in the newspaper and the literature. Um, things like, you know, the regulatory process can be very complicated. The reimbursement model, we talked a little bit about procurement before. Um, the, I think the one, um, 
the the one the the second last one I want to um, kind of uh, uh, focus on is just um, customer bandwidth, um, cultural momentum, and kind of sunk costs. And and by that I mean is that you have you you sometimes can have the actual perfect product. The customer can believe that it's the perfect product, um, uh, but because because they're just too busy and like, you know, we're currently in the middle of a pandemic, we're doing this, you know, virtually, um, they may just not simply have the bandwidth to be able to adopt a new, a new piece of technology. And that's, and that's really, that can be really frustrating. They can be nodding with you and saying, yes, this is wonderful, but I just, I just, I don't have the bandwidth to be able to help you nav navigate the system to be able to go through the procurement process. Or they may say, you know, um, your product is amazing, but um, but you know we've we've just invented or we've just invested you know uh, ten million dollars in a new electronic health record system, and despite the fact that yours is better, um, I can't you know I can't we can't we we can't just buy a, a, a second one because all that money is, um, uh, is 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 you know it's already been put in, or they may just sort of say look I, you know I'm sold. But, you know, I can't, I just can't get my surgeons to change their practice about how they conduct surgeries and that, and all those things are really frustrating. Um, okay, so I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to skip over this. This is just a pick me up for, you know, leverage your enablers, mitigate your constraints against or sort of, it's sort of strategy 101. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to give three very quick examples about some innovation uh, that, um, that have gone well have, or have not. And, um, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Matthew. The uh, first one uh, I just wanted is a Fitbit. Um, this was a really interesting one where uh, Fitbit was a really early innovator. They had lots of sales. They sort of dominated the market, and then and then something happened. They um, they were not able to continue listening to what the customer needed. And Apple Watch, which is not on this on this slide, but if it was, you'd see it go straight up starting in 2016. Um, came in and said, actually, you know what? The customer actually wants additional features. They want, you know, these other little pieces and as a res and fully integrated into their phone and da, 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 da. And as a result, um, you know, they, the Fitbit fell off the, fell off the map uh, and was actually subsequently acquired by, by another company. Um, so that was, that was sort of a, kind of an interesting a use case of just of an early innovator, but who, who, who lost that position. Another one was around failure to understand the market uh, and around AI was the, uh, uh, in 2014, IBM entered in sort of, they developed Watson to, uh, with a lots of fanfare. And by 2021, uh, they said goodbye um, because they just simply didn't understand how to apply this in a healthcare context. And, um, and it was just, and, and it was just shut down. The final one is just around time and pressure. And this is around sort of luck and timing. Um, so in the 1980s, um, we, uh, sort of starting in the 80s based on some work out in BC and then building it in the 90s, um, you know, we figured out how to use uh, messenger RNA. Uh, but it took until 2019 um, and a new illness being reported before the, the, its value was truly um, identified and, uh, and then very quickly was able to go out. So this is a case um, where Moderna uh, and Pfizer were able, you know, it's a, you know, an overnight success, uh, literally decades, uh, you know, four decades in the, in the making. Anyway, I've gone on a while. Um, so I'm going to stop here and pass it over to Matthew. Um, uh, so I want to say thank you. And then I'm happy to, at the end, answer any additional questions. And, um, and Dr. Zeng will, will have these slides and can share them because uh, I, I know I did go through a lot of content pretty quickly. Over to you, Matthew. Right. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for inviting me today. Um, today's going to be an overview of my company, but uh, I'll, I'm happy to kind of pause and talk about some of the trials and tribulations that I've been going through starting this startup. So Prova is really a, it's a med tech company focused on developing smart insoles for gait rehab for both children and adults. Um, I started the company, uh, really our history begins eight years ago with the birth of my son, Samuel. Samuel has cerebral palsy. Um, and the standard of care for, uh, for this mobility issue is really, you know, in clinic twice a week if you're lucky, doing physio, and then practice, practice at home. And this is where, you know, it was really frustrating for me because this therapist could refine his gait, but as soon as we uh, leave clinic, 
he kind of reverted back to what he was more comfortable with. And we would sort of lose all that training that we did. Um, for me, you know, Alex kind of touched on the voice of the customer. Um, the situation's a little bit different because I'm not coming out of academia. I'm coming out of industry. I have a really good understanding of the customer needs, but I need to build partnerships within academia um, and within industry and within associations to sort of make this business happen. So that's a challenge. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that in some of the questions. So I launched this company in 2019. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing was as an outsider was joining an innovation hub uh, through Innovation Factory, through the Forge, to kind of give me the support and the tools necessary to help promote and build this business. So let me just minimize it. So, you know, we learn movement through repetition and practice. Uh, if we look at, you know, the best at the game, um, you know, top athletes, they don't just become this way. Uh, they did this through, through practice, you know, Jordan practiced five hours a day. And, but the thing is, he had an army of support around him, coaches, trainers, uh, you know, supporting him along the way. When you're trying to recover after uh, an injury, you know, you're trying to do this at home on your own. You may not necessarily have that support. Um, so I like to say, you know, if you're practicing a limp, that may lead to a limp. So this is really where the issue is, is that patients either they don't do the exercises or they if they do, they don't do them well. And this can lead to all kinds of limitations for long recovery. It's frustrating for clinicians when I talk to them because uh, they can't see the full picture. Patients often try to um, uh, overperform when they're in clinic. You know, and uh, and that that can lead to poor treatment decisions, and ultimately this has a negative impact on our healthcare system. You know, these are this is a summary of kind of slides that that Alex showed of you know how how this is going to be a great product. Every medtech company is going to have something like this about how we're going to improve costs and efficiencies. So here's our product. We're branding it as Within Stride. It's the world's first uh, gait rehabilitation system. It's really meant for home use promote gate rehab 24 seven at home and on the go. It acts as a virtual therapist, providing the patient with biofeedback as well as a remote gate lab. Uh, so the way it works is, um, it's really meant to promote and encourage good form. So if we want to improve an aspect of gait like stride length, uh, the patient would feel a small vibration on the heel that would encourage them to take a longer stride or a shorter stride depending on what we want to correct. And the idea here is that by reinforcing this, um, you're creating new muscle memory, new synaptic pathways in the brain, and you're encouraging them uh, and promoting it. So we also have a SaaS system, so a remote, uh, remote software portal. Um, what's really exciting for me is this is driving efficacy. I, I'm hoping to move that, uh, uh, wanting to perform from the, uh, from, <laughs> I got, I got a lot of stuff going on. It's a busy place here in the Forge today. Uh, this is the busiest I think it's ever been. Um, anyways, uh, we want to move that, that uh, ability to perform from the clinic into the home. Because now the patient can see their goals, they can track their progress live, and the clinician can also see it too. Uh, so our products are, uh, they do this in real time. It's adaptive. So they're situationally aware whether the patient is running or walking. The queuing can change uh, accordingly. And, um, you know, what's exciting is that it's meant to be used at all stages of rehabilitation. So whether you're prehabbing or trying to prevent or, or delay a surgery, um, it's fantastic, but it's even better post-surgery. Um, you know, because uh, again, it's when I talk to clinicians, they say the biggest thing that, that promotes recovery is that the patients get up and start doing the exercises. So I started in the pediatric space because that's what I knew. And Alex kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, I had to do a pivot. I had to do a pivot because uh, in pediatrics, I found it very hard to raise money and financing necessary to make this business go. When I started to talk to investors, it just wasn't relatable, um, you know, particularly cerebral palsy. So I started to look at other segments that, you know, I could start to build and scale a business on. 
Uh, I looked at things in the aging segment, such as stroke and dementia. And where I, I sort of landed on as my first beachhead marker was the osteoarthritis market, which, you know, uh, Dr. Cobbsar can speak to it, but it's a humongous market. Um, nearly half of all adults after the age of 40 are going to develop some type of osteoarthritis. Uh, and many will go on to, uh, to need uh, joint replacement. And it's a growing market. That population is going to be, uh, you know, done. Few decades. So uh, this gets certainly from an investor standpoint, they get very excited about this, and it's relatable to them. They all seem to know someone with a bum hip, or a, or a bruised knee, or something. Um, so in terms of the competition in this space, it is all startups, which is exciting. So this is sort of a, a, a new segment, a new uh, offering in the wearable space. Um, most of the startups are more focused on athletics. Um, some are on the diagnostic side, but I think where Prova um, really differentiates is we're focused particularly on, on gait rehabilitation and particularly for abnormal gait. Our products are meant for being used at home and uh, we offer this biofeedback, which is very unique. So in terms of traction, um, you know, we've We've won a number of awards. I think as a as a startup, you have to look for ways to finance your business, especially in the early stages of you know your TRL one through through seven. And the way to do that is through government grants, uh, through pitch competitions. All of these take a lot of time to write and then coordinate and, and follow up. But it's really it's really the way to do it because very little investors will come in unless you have a, a, a demonstrated team that, is, is, that has repeated success, will come, we'll come in and uh, we'll come in and, and give you money based on an idea. We have to demonstrate some form of traction. Um, so that's part of it. The other thing is I, I mentioned uh, before around partnerships within academia and partnerships within associations. So I have a, I like to say, I like to think a strong partnership within Synapse. Um, we're looking at a possible funding route to do our clinical trials right now. Uh, I am trying to identify the right um, clinical champion in KOL within the community to make this happen. I, uh, I certainly have an affiliation and my heart is, is within the McMaster community. This is where I want to build, uh, where I want to build this business and grow it. So in terms of in terms of the team, you know I've done uh, a lot of work with students within McMaster. Uh, two of the students are here today. Uh, Andrew and Guha uh, have been uh, spending time with me over the last few months, helping me do some of the development. My background, uh, so I am a McMaster grad. I did both my uh, my uh, engineering degree and business degree through McMaster. I spent a decade in aerospace. And I, I I'd had a career change, uh, you know, uh, because of a life event, right? When my son was born, I, I had to do something different. And this is where I'm focused now on, uh, on the health tech sector. So it is about learning this sector and there are a lot of challenges and uniqueness around it. I've worked for um, for-profit, big and small, private, government, non-for-profit, and now startup. And this is the most challenging, but it's also the most fun. Uh, really important putting together a good team around you, um, you know, to help support you. So I have a, on my advisory board, I it's comprised of physicians, therapists, directors, and serial entrepreneurs that are really helping guide, guide my product development. So just to talk about some of the milestones quickly. You know, to date, uh, Alex touched on the patents. Excuse me, check on the time. Okay, I'll try to go quickly here. Um, the patents are really important. Uh, if you don't have a patent in the medtech space, you're not going to get any kind of financing to really make it go. Uh, it, it's a key piece, especially early on in the early stages. Um, you know, we talked about provisional patents. I think what's the most important thing here is delaying the cost as long as possible, too. Your, um, an international filing, which I'm going through right now, just the filing costs alone, uh, probably over the next two years, are gonna be somewhere in the ballpark of 150 to 200K. Um, you know, over the life of the patent with annuities and, and whatnot, it's probably gonna be about a million dollars, but by, the idea is by that time, you've already grown the company. So you really, 
you really only want to file in the areas in which you plan to do business, but it's hard sometimes to know, especially at the beginning, uh, where you're going to end up. So the patent pathway is, um, or the patent strategy is really important to think through up front. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, you have a little bit of leeway with the provisional patent. Um, it can be filed a provisional, you know, a year after you published, um, and then you have another year to file your your uh, your actual uh, patent as well. Okay, so this year where we are, uh, we've we've developed a working prototype, and we're working towards our MVP. I'll have some pictures in a bit. Um, I've also talked to a number of investors. It's chicken and egg, man. It's uh, let's see the MVP before we invest. But you know, I need the money to make the MVP, so it's it's a challenge all the time. Um, but I've been working towards the seed round, which is you know I'm trying to raise about 1.2 million. And that would support a team of around five to ten people, uh, allow me to do all the clinical work that I want to do next year, and then prepare for a launch uh, in 2023. There's also the regulatory filing. This is a class two medical device. Uh, a lot to get into there. Uh, we don't have enough time today to talk about it, but I'll just move along here. Uh, so where I want to be is I want this company to be $18 million, you know, five years from launch. Um, I have a business case built around this of the 12,000 patient capture. Uh, not enough time to get into all the details here, but there's lots of opportunity to market and size this. What's really important, again, is going back to the KOLs, the people that can lead this, because for me as an outsider, I really need strong um, influencers to help uh, guide the product, because ultimately the consumer will pay for it, the recommendation will come from the clinician. Uh, so let me show the prototype here. I don't know if I set up the sound, share sound. This, is, this was the early prototype, so I'll just play it through here. Here's a demonstration of our prototype. Right now it's in backpack form, but the intent is to miniaturize it to fit all within a flexible form factor such as this. So for this demonstration, I'll show the cueing that a patient would receive if he or she were to into during a step. So this would be a normal step, everything is green. And if intoing were to proceed, the user would get a sound and a light and you might be able to hear the vibration that's taking place. This would guide the foot back to a more neutral position. So this early prototype was a backpack form. It was an over the sole mount, uh, but it demonstrated, uh, it demonstrated all the cueing from an auditory, visual and sensory standpoint. Um, right now where we are in the development is we're working on an install. We still have a controller on the outside of the insole that houses the battery and some of the control units. Um, here it is on the bench, uh, we're working towards that now. And then the next version, uh, what I would say is the MVP, which I'm hoping to have completed sort of early or Q1 for sure, uh, is uh, a complete insole package. Um, so this is part of the line. Uh, there will be additional units added uh, around the shank and knee, and this will provide more kinematic information about the body, which I think will be um, really useful in certain applications. Gait is a fantastic biomarker for disease progression. Not, I know I talked about osteoarthritis today, but there's many applications of it, um, from predicting uh, concussion recovery, uh, early onset dementia, Parkinson's disease, um, even some cancers can be determined via changes in gait. So having something that's in a small form factor that you know you kind of almost forget about, it, it's just in your shoe, can be quite useful from that standpoint. But the key is finding the first market. That's the most important thing. Uh, what's your beach head market going to be? Because everything else can be built around that. Um, so financing is so important. Uh, it's the biggest challenge keeping that runway going. And I think as an entrepreneur in a startup med tech world, you have to be comfortable with knowing your runway is only maybe three months and then, uh, and then you're gonna crash. So you have, to be, you have to be a little bit comfortable with that because my runway has been like that for the last two years. Um, and I'm able to you know, apply uh, and do all this overhead to sort of keep it going as long as I can. So I'm getting to a point now where the costs are starting to get quite big, particularly on the, on the patent front. Um, and so, yeah, that concludes the presentation. I know we went a little bit long. So we have five minutes for questions. <laughs> Q and A. 
Okay, thanks uh, both Alex and uh, Matthew. Any question from the audience? So Alex, Matthew, how are you on, on time? Because, um, um, you know, are, the, are you okay to go a little oh, yeah. bit over I, time? I'm yeah, yeah I, got, I, got, I got a few. I got a few minutes uh, extra, and and uh, though it was it was nice to see some of some of the themes that I that I mentioned uh, echoed back in in Matthew's. It's, we I swear we didn't coordinate. It's uh, but it's it, so despite the fact that every every company is going to have its own unique um, experience, it's going to have its own unique path. It's going to have its its inception. is going to be it's going to be based, you know, there's all sorts of reasons, you know, someone might just say, you know, I, I discovered a really neat thing in a lab, or it might be, it might be as in Matthew's case, like a, a family incident that, that inspires someone to, to really put that drive in. Um, despite that, the, the, the nature of some of the challenges and obstacles around capital, around kind of getting the right users, around finding clinician champions, those are common. How you resolve each of those ones is going to be different based again on your circumstances, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, no, it's good. So it looks like, oh, uh, Dylan. Uh, hey, thanks. Thanks to both of you for the, the great talks. Um, tons of things to discuss. I think one of the, the initial questions, I guess, it is kind of expanding on, on Audrey's uh, comment uh, or, or question there. Um, and it's maybe a bit of like an existential question, but in terms of academia, um, in its relationship to commercialization, I think that is a bit of this existential crisis of we have so many other things going on, but, and our funding is public funding uh, for the most part, if we're getting grants, right? Um, how do you see that kind of tying into funding agencies? You know, there, I think there's a bigger focus on the commercialization side of it, but I guess maybe if you can speak to that a little bit more of how we can do better at this as academics. I got some thoughts, but Matthew, do you want to go? Yeah, I certainly, my experience, you know, I, I've worked in, in prior to this uh, quite a bit with academia. I think it's really important to identify the industry partner on some of those earlier applications. That TRL six to seven gap has always been a problem, right? Because the, there's conflicting priorities as to what's needed. And the issue too, you know, within Academia and a partnership is always around timing. Um, the private sector has a much quicker uh, time requirement than what at, what academia. So having that partnership is is important because much of the funding it's much easier for the government to provide funding within innovation hubs within academia. Uh, within institutions than to any one particular company because you never want to show um, a bias, right? So I think it comes down to partnership arrangements and collaborations and each has their own strength. Um, you know, my talk a lot today was around some of the business uh, aspects of all those challenges that, that exist. And that's that's difficult when you when you want to do just the research. Like I'm I'm in a unique position because I'm wearing a couple of different hats. Right now I'm pretty heavy in the R&D and I've kind of had to just put some of the business development, you know, on the, on the back shelf somewhat because it's hard to switch around between the two. But looking for that partnership um, certainly, uh, certainly would be helpful, right? Having, having partners that can work uh, with you and maybe just focus on the R&D while you go off and raise money and, and do all that other not not so fun stuff uh, would be great. So I would I, I would echo Matthew's comments. Um, uh, a couple of kind of initial thoughts. So one is that is that governments are starting to put more and more money into translational research and are starting to reward um, through a requirement for external partners, uh, the idea of academia uh, or academics engaging. Um, and so I think, so you just need to know which rocks to look under uh, to find that. Um, I think that uh, a big, it, it, it's a big challenge that, that, you're, that you're facing, that you're articulating is culture. And, um, and culture is really hard to change. And it, it, it's slowly changing at McMaster um, and there are kind of 
fundamentally it's going to it's going to require a a raising of the status that is and uh and the plaudits that uh, uh someone receives by taking by taking um uh, ip and turning it into a company um and because um because the, because you're right, all those other expectations around teaching, around publishing, those are not going to go away. Um, so it's you have to you have to introduce something else, and that's going to be leadership. So that's you're going to have to have the deans and you know the provosts and the presidents and and other structural supports, noting success and celebrating it, so that people can can feel good about that. Um, I would say uh, in general. Um, in general, finding a successful academic entrepreneur is um, like finding a unicorn. Um, uh, and 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 that's not. And I don't say that in a dis, in a in a way that might sound disparaging. But um, uh, 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 academics are incredibly detail oriented. They are methodical. They move kind of through processes. They're very structured. And all those things that make you a successful academic make you kind of a terrible entrepreneur. The ability to pivot, like the speed with which you go, the fact that you kind of obey the Pareto rule all the time, like if that, the, you know, like bragging that you've done something before you're actually doing it in order to be able to, as, as Matthew said, overcome those chicken and eggs. Like all those things are counterintuitive. So to find a successful academic who's an entrepreneur, it's, it is like, yeah, it's, it's a unicorn. However, the IP and the knowledge, you can't have a successful company without that, that IP and knowledge. So that you are an essential piece. And what I would say is that for those who are thinking about taking their IP, stop it. You have to stop at one point. And it's usually around the time after you raise a little bit of initial money and say, who can I bring in to complement my team, to complement my skill set, and to drive this forward? Where can I find a Matthew who can take this technology and move it? You know, I mean, not Matthew. Obviously, Matthew's doing his own thing, but like find someone with that skill set, and yeah, that's the yeah. That's I think I think startups. I think it is a team sport. So I'm yeah. I'm kind of in a unique place here where I'm a sole founder, but uh, you know, I'm not opposed to taking on an additional founder if it's complementary to the team. I think it's actually important because uh, investors like that too because there's not a single point of failure. It makes it a little bit easier and each has their own strengths. So I think, you know, right now I'm a sole founder, but I think going forward, most companies end up with one or two. I wouldn't go beyond two founders. Uh, I've seen some companies with as much as seven, and that's a disaster. Um, you have to be able to work together and you have to be able to understand that um, not everything is going to be uh, fun all the time. I think uh, the other situation, like with the McMaster, the IP transfer arrangements are fantastic. Um, you know, the IP arrangements here are great. Waterloo is another example, and ours are kind of based off of that. When I look at other universities, there are some that are terrible arrangements for founders. You know, like board seats and percent ownership and equity uh, doesn't really, and, and investors hate that. They hate seeing, you know, an IP transfer office on the term sheet, uh, you know, not term sheet on the cap table. Like, why? What's the advantage of uh, of having that that place work, right? So, uh, I think we're in a in a great place with the McMaster community to do collaboration, but I think there needs to be multiple founders uh, if you're looking at transferring from less six to seven, because there's a lot of headache in the business development side to make the business go. Jazeen, it looks like you're, you're uh, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that answer. I think, uh, as you said, Alex, it's a cultural thing, right? Like publications are our currency um, for better or worse, maybe for worse. Um, but I think that, I think there is a, a shift in that. I think you're right. It's coming from, um, from different areas, but I, I do think that there's, that there's a shift in that. And I think it's, it's important um for sure yeah yeah and, and and those ones who've been successful so the john valiant the bramsons the sheila sings the you know eric browns who have, who are starting or creating companies and who are showing us the way it's that's also really that's really we're lucky to have those because that's inspiring the next generation and it's creating space for those who maybe were on the on the 
uh, on the fence to say, oh, right, like, well, not only can I make a whole lot of money, but actually I can, um, I, I can get some recognition for the effort I put in. And, and cause you guys, yeah, you guys have a limited amount of time and publishing is so hard. So totally, totally get it. Um, any other questions? Perfect. Um, excellent discussion. And uh, actually I have tons of questions set up, but I, I think we're running out of time. So I think maybe uh, this, this I think is something that requires probably more interaction and engagement. Something we may consider like uh, inviting you guys again during our public symposium this summer. Um, so to, to have further um, interaction. So uh, thanks again uh, for both of you for spending the time with us and share with us your experience. Yeah, and, and consider this an open invitation to come and visit uh, the Forge as things open up and to the new year um, after the, to the demonstration, anyone in demonstration of our product and, and there we are. Yeah, and thank, thank you very much for inviting us into uh, into your class. It was really, it was, uh, it was lovely to be here um, and, and it's and it's efforts like this that that create bridges and 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 certainly happy to uh, uh, you know through Dr. Zeng uh, uh, to continue to be a resource. So just uh, uh, you can feel free to to scratch my door and and uh, happy to help out. Definitely, thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone for attending. Have right. a lovely weekend. Thanks. See ya. Cheers. Thank you.